All right, we got um, some people still coming in, but I'm going to go ahead and start. <clears throat> I'm going to try to let you out, you know, at a reasonable time so you can go get your uh, children from Moana and then, or just get home and hopefully it's not raining too bad. A um, couple things I want to tell you before we get started is we have, uh, you have in front of you and all the tables around here, we have plenty of already hole punched notes for tonight and for every night that you come, there will be hole punch notes each week already set out for you guys. And if you want to purchase a binder, you can, you can either go to Office Depot and, and mock up something, write foundations with a Sharpie if you want to, but I think they're probably eight bucks, nine bucks at, at Office Depot. Or you can run by the bookstore on your way out and pay $5.36 with tax. <laughs> so they told me to make sure I said $5.36. So you, I didn't say five bucks and you got there, you know, you had a $5 bill and they had to have tax. So <clears throat> anyway, whatever. Churches pay taxes, just so you know. Um, so this will be the little binder. It's, I think it's helpful. It'll be good. You can keep all of, uh, track of all of your notes throughout, and you can just build yourself a library. And if you, once you get through several series, maybe you can do it once a year and buy a new one. Um, it'll, be, it'll be helpful to you in the future. So that's the idea behind this. The idea behind this is if any of you know or are familiar with Ligonier Ministries, anybody familiar with R.C. Sproul, Ligonier Ministries, they have branded themselves as... Uh, a ministry that kind of fills the gap between Sunday school and seminary. Uh, I know we call it community groups now, but that's what they call it. So anyway, we, uh, our goal is to kind of fill that same space. We want to fill the gap between, between the community group, between the Sunday school uh, level to a seminary level. We want to be the, the bridge, the in-between. You know, we don't want to have you doing any kind of crazy assignments, but we definitely want to teach you some things that would be taught at the seminary level. We want to help you to think through some things and uh, to be um, discipled well. And so that's our goal with Foundations. Um, that's the only commercial I have with the Foundations book. I'm going to keep mine open up here because it has your notes. Uh, and I can't read that TV from here. <clears throat> I'm in a suit because two reasons. One, we had a funeral this morning. Uh, Charles Alley was a faithful member of our church for a very long time and a wonderful man, and we celebrated his life uh, and homegoing today in this very room this morning. Uh, so I came uh, dressed for that this morning at 10, and, or the event started at 10, and then I have a vehicle that no longer has a master cylinder, a brake cylinder attached to it, because I took it off last night, and we can't find one anywhere in town to replace it. So I, it's sitting in my driveway and I had no way to get home today. So I am in a suit, not because I'm trying to impress you. It's simply because I didn't have a ride to go back home and change clothes to get back for this evening. You know you so, <clears throat> Pablo, thank you. I appreciate it. People, everybody needs a Pablo in their life. All right. <clears throat> now, with all that said, oh, there's plenty of room over here. If you're, there's several seats available at the tables over here. There's plenty of room to sit down. There's several seats over here. Uh, anywhere around. I'm going to say the uh, opening prayer and then we can get started. Let's do this. Father, we thank you for this evening and for this opportunity. We thank you for this church, uh, for the people here at Hickory Grove who are willing to uh, be discipled, who are willing to bring their children in the, in the rain and in the midst of all kind of craziness in our world to hear the Word of God taught and preached and to memorize it and to hide it in their hearts. We thank you for uh, that kind of commitment level for the people of Hickory Grove. I pray tonight that you would be honored uh, by your word and your truth. Uh, we pray that you would work in our hearts and that the people that are in our midst, uh, the members of Hickory Grove Baptist Church, who may be struggling with different, different things in their life, uh, their deaths, their financial difficulties, all kind of things that are going on in everybody's life. We pray that you'd minister to them, give grace to those tonight, and allow your name to be lifted up and you'd be honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Um, so you can uh, look at your notes. I'm going to give you a little introduction, and you can start. Um, as we get to the notes, they will pop up on this screen above me here, and you'll be able to follow along pretty closely. <clears throat> we are kind of basing this talk tonight off of J.T. English's 
book called Deep Discipleship. It's also in the bookstore on your way out. I'm giving a lot of commercials tonight. It's a very well-written book. It's a book about discipleship and the need for discipleship in the local church. Uh, it's a convicting book, and it's also one that we're going to use for our lesson tonight. So a lot of the things you're going to hear me say tonight, I'm just going to go ahead and give credit ahead of time that it's JT English uh, that is a lot of these thoughts, okay? Anything you hear that's bad is my thoughts. Anything you hear is good is JT English. <clears throat> so he tells a story in the opening of his book about his wife. They were... Uh, um, went to the doctor. She had kind of hurt her leg or her thigh in some kind of event. There are plenty of chairs still over here to, the, to my right, and there's some in the middle. There's still openings. <clears throat> and so uh, they went to the doctor, and there's <clears throat> they, the doctor checks her out, sees some things, and they put her in this room for a very long time. She's confused at what's going on. He's confused. I mean, they were there for a couple hours <clears throat> waiting on the doctor, the doctor returns and sits down into, in the room and says, look, I'm, I'm really concerned. I, I can't lie to you. <clears throat> we, have found, we have found this mass, and we think it might be cancerous. This looks like a sarcoma. And so this was like Memorial Day weekend or Labor Day weekend, and so they had to go home, and they were, look, back, back in my office Tuesday morning, we're going to you know, test this and see what's going on. <clears throat> So they had to go through the whole weekend, holiday weekend, I mean, in all kind of stress. Uh, deep prayer, all kind of uh, struggling. And they get to the doctor's office on Tuesday morning, they take the test, and the doctor says, I believe we've confirmed. It's better news than what I thought. I don't think it's as aggressive as it was uh, the other day, but I think it is what we think it was. And so uh, we need to talk about treatment plan. But I want to do one more thing. I want to send you to a specialist. One more step to make sure. We want to be 100% sure of what we're dealing with so we can, we can get the right treatment plan. We don't want to treat it the wrong way. <clears throat> well, so she goes to the specialist. They, they treat her, and it's a Harvard specialist. This guy's an expert. And they have to go through all these tests, and they go, they go home, and so they don't know anything, and he's going to call them later. But he calls, he missed the call, and gets it from his, on his voicemail. And the doctor says, hey, I, I need to talk to you real, uh, as soon as possible. There's an update I need to give you. And so they're frantic, like, I don't know what we need to do. So they call, they call, they call. They finally get through. And he says, I, uh, I have some good news. <clears throat> You've been misdiagnosed. It's actually a blood clot of cells. That's there's a specific case. It's a rare case, but there's a specific type of disease that, that blood clots, these cells clump together and they look like some kind of sarcoma and it gets misdiagnosed uh, a, a lot of times when that is the case. <clears throat> so she was elated, of course, uh, but they also, you can't unlive the stress and the difficulty of running through those moments thinking you're, you could die. Um, because she was told this was in a really aggressive form of sarcoma. There are still some seats over here to my right, uh, lots of them. So the, the big thing that was helpful was that the doctor wanted to make sure, because imagine if they just ran with the first diagnosis and started treating that. When you treat it the wrong way, you, it could be deadly. It could be fatal. This could be a terrible situation. And so good thing that this doctor had enough wisdom to decide to make sure that he wanted to make 100% sure and sent to a specialist. Well, this is, a, this is what happens in, in a lot of times in churches. We, we all recognize that churches have a deficiency in discipleship. The Christian world is deficient at some levels in discipleship. And we've got all kinds of symptoms. But if we don't get the right diagnosis, then we can't treat it correctly. And so what are some symptoms of of Light discipleship or bad discipleship or not enough discipleship. People leaving the church, that is a symptom. People, uh, students that leave the student ministry and go to college and drop out, it could be a, a symptom of lack of discipleship. could also be a symptom of not being saved in the first place, but that's a whole other conversation I'll have for you later. Um, Attendance is spotty, cultural Christianity, worldliness. We all know and recognize symptoms of lack of discipleship in the church. 
Well, we can, we can give the wrong diagnosis. And we have for years. Some churches have approached it, well, you know, it's too, it's too deep, it's too hard. We're asking too many things from people. Uh, church is too demanding. There's too much to, to do. We need to make this, you know, a little bit easier to attend and to accomplish. We need to make things a little bit easier for the average person, the lay person that attends on church. Uh, maybe the church is too irrelevant. We need to make sure that we're more relevant in how we teach. So that would be the prescriptions. Let's, let's make things less hard. Let's be less demanding and less, let's be less irrelevant. So let's make sure that we're real relevant and we get the, bring the culture in the church a little bit more. And we've got to be careful with those things. That's the wrong prescription to an already wrong diagnosis. So we need a purpose. We need the right purpose. To treat this disease, we need to make sure that we treat it with the right, the right prescription. We have to rightly diagnose it and then treat it with the right prescription. Give it the right things. So what is the right diagnosis? The church is too shallow. There are too many trivial things going on in churches. The church is too undemanding from its people. Now, I don't mean in the sense of time. I don't want to make you live here and bring a sleeping bag. You need to stay here, uh, rent some space and have a cot and only come to church. We're not talking about that, but what we are talking about is we need to challenge you. Churches aren't challenging anymore. I want you to think. We go outside of the church and start thinking. This is where doubt creeps in and all kind of conversations happen with coworkers, and you're unequipped to deal with those things because the church isn't challenging you enough. And so we need to be more challenging. We need to be less culturally accommodating. We need to have more depth, more demands, not fewer, more distinctiveness, and not less. We need to, be, we need to look more like Christ than we do the culture. And so as a church, we need to do these things. So tonight, the theme is that we, God's people, need deep discipleship. You need deep discipleship. Not shallow discipleship. And not, a lot of people think the cure to everything is let's just teach a lot of people how to, how to preach Jesus and be evangelistic and that'll solve all of our problems because once people get saved, then everything is perfect. Right? How many of you are saved in this room and things aren't perfect in your life? Don't raise your hand. Right? It doesn't help you if you don't learn. That's the beginning, right? That's the start. Discipleship is moving you from, it's moving you from non-believer to a believer. But it's also moving you from a young believer or an immature believer to a mature believer. So discipleship works in both those lanes. And we need to make sure that we're growing and not just settling for being saved. We got in the door, we're stopping at the threshold, clogging up the place. We need to make sure that we keep moving forward. <clears throat> So there's three reasons we need deep discipleship. Number one is because deep discipleship is necessary. It is necessary. We have a lot of people in this world that are spiritually hungry, but they're apathetic towards Christ. Like they're hungry for spiritual things. I want to be spiritual. I'm looking for spiritual things to fulfill me in some sort of way. I mean, it could even be this church that are spiritual things that fulfill me, serving in some capacity, doing certain things that look spiritual, look Christian, but I'm apathetic toward Christ himself, the person of Christ. We, we don't need a thousand more programs. We need to focus on the person of Christ. And we need deep discipleship with Jesus. It's necessary for us. There is apostasy. You see the apostasy we have in our culture. People that are big name Christians walking away from the faith. And some people think that's a huge deal. It's a big deal. And it's dangerous to the church. And it might be. I probably disagree that I don't think it's dangerous to the church. This is what the church does. It, doctrine divides. Jesus came to separate the sheep and the goats. When you keep walking with the Lord, people are going to fall away. Who you thought may have been Christians. Who really weren't. Apathy is a bigger problem in the church than apostasy. 
It's the apathy that we have in our churches. And not just this church. I'm talking about every church. That's the bigger problem. So we need to make sure that we have a knowledge of God, that we're, we're striving for more knowledge of God and not just self-improvement. We, think, we can sometimes think that discipleship is self-improvement when it's, it's not. It's knowing who God is. I want to know more about God. I want, to know who the, I want to know the character of God. Think of it this way. You, you spend a good bit of time with, with friends, um, maybe family members. If you ever have a, you have a family member that has a weird laugh or a friend that has a weird laugh, maybe it's a cackle, it's a loud and obnoxious. If you spend too much time with that friend, guess what happens to you? You kind of bring that little cackle around you sometimes, right? Or you say those obnoxious things words or phrases that they say. Maybe this friend says dude a lot and you're like, you start saying dude at work and you're like, what am I saying dude for? This is inappropriate. You're, you're a colleague. I should speak better towards you. I have this friend and he says dude all the time and it just comes out. So this may happen to you. If you spend a lot of time with people, they start to rub off on you. If you spend enough time with the Lord, His character will rub off on you. And that's what we want. It's necessary in your life. It's necessary because absolute truth exists. We live in a world that's the cancer of postmodernism. Relativity. What's true for you isn't necessarily true for me. You hear people say these terms like, well, he's speaking his truth. What does that even mean? I don't... If I say 2 plus 2 is 5, does that make it true because that's my truth? No, there is absolute truth that exists. Relatively, relativity and postmodernism say that objective truth doesn't exist. They say that objectively. They say it absolutely. Oh, it doesn't exist. Well, if it doesn't exist, then that's a self-defeating statement, period. Absolute truth does exist. And we either worship a true God or God of our own imaginations. But absolute truth does exist. Look, I know this is a, a C.S. Lewis. This has actually been attributed to a several other people. Even before C.S. Lewis, there's this Lord, liar, and lunatic um, question that's been raised to Jesus. Jesus is either a liar a lunatic, or he's actually the Lord. He can't be all three. He can't be one of those. He has to be, or he can't be three of those. He has to be one of those. He's either a liar or a lunatic. Maybe he can be both, liar and lunatic, but he can't be a Lord if he's not a liar. You know, he's got, if he's not lying, he is the Lord. And so we, we understand this. There is absolute truth that exists. We need to make sure that we're chasing after this truth. And then also, we need deep discipleship. It is necessary because love requires truth. If I truly love you, I have to tell you the truth. I need to tell you the truth. Otherwise, I really don't love you. If I'm lying to you and telling you good things even though it's not true, that's flattery and that's wrong. 1 Corinthians 13.6 says, Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. To love someone truly is to tell them the truth even when it's hard. The truth must be told. Since truth exists, we need deep discipleship. It's necessary. Deep discipleship is also relevant. It's relevant. Because it reveals the real you. Leonard Ravenhill some of you uh, may have heard that name. I think Kyler has quoted that, uh, the book he's written a few times. Leonard Ravenhill wrote a book called uh, Why Revival Tarries. It's actually a, it's a good little book, but it's, anyway, it doesn't matter. There's a good quote. He says this, There are three persons living inside each of you. The person you think you are, the person others think you are, and the person God knows you are. 
That's why James 1.22 tells us that the Word is like a mirror and it reveals our sinfulness. It shows us who we really are. This truth exists in our life. This truth is relevant to our lives now. It reveals our sinfulness. It reveals our selfishness. It reveals who we are. It also lets us know that God is our greatest good. He is the greatest thing in our life. When the Bible tells us that that God is a jealous God, you may be confused and think God is somehow pitching a fit and throwing His toys and getting mad that you're not paying attention to Him. And He's like some kid going, look what I can do. And He's not. He's not a jealous God in, in that sense. He's a God that knows that He is the greatest thing in your life. He is the greatest thing that can happen to you. Let me see if I can, I can help you understand some of this a little bit with this little so, silly story. So if I take a, a paper, uh, when I was a high school student in 12th grade, I had an English paper to turn in, and I paid a fella in my class to write it and turn it in. I gave him probably five bucks. I don't know. It wasn't much. He was the smartest kid in class. I was not the smartest kid in class. And he wrote the paper and turned it in, and I got a good grade on it. <clears throat> now, did, did I do something wrong? Yes, I did something wrong. That's, that's plagiarism. I turned somebody else's work as in my. It was, I turned it in as if it was my work. Did he do something wrong? Yes, he was also plagiarizing. He was doing something wrong too. He was turning, letting me work, turn his work in. And he got paid for it. And it was wrong. And if the teacher asked him, hey, Corey, is this your work? And he said, no, he's lying. So when the Lord, when the Lord won't let anybody else get the glory that he deserves, it's because nobody else deserves the glory. And he would be in sin if he let anybody else get that glory. He can't say, hey, good job, angels. Y'all made a great cloud today. Well, they didn't do that. That would be a lie. He can't. That's who his character is. He's holy. He's perfectly holy. And because he knows he's holy, he's the best thing for you. There is no other God, no other gimmick, no other thing that exists in this world or does not exist that may just exist in your mind that will be helpful to you, that will sustain you when, when hard times come, that can provide hope for you, that can provide guidance for you, that can speak the truth to you, than God Himself. He is our greatest good. He is the greatest thing that we can chase after in our life. He's not jealous because He's whining. He's jealous because He knows He is the greatest thing that you need in your life. And we need to pursue Him. We don't need to pursue God because it'll make us better. We need to pursue God because He is God and He's holy and it's right for us to do this. It's just the right thing that, that we're supposed to do. We're created for that. 2nd it's relevant because everyone is a theologian. You are a theologian. Everyone has a God. Everyone has a, con a conception of God. And the real question is, are you a good theologian or a bad theologian? You all have an idea and you all have answers to the life's biggest questions. You've all thought about it. You may have terrible answers for those. You may have really good answers for those things. But every one of us are, is a theologian. We're all theologians. And we need discipleship because we need to make sure that we're thinking rightly about this holy God. This is important for us. Deep discipleship is also practical. So not only is deep discipleship necessary, not only is it uh, relevant, it is also practical. Because right belief informs right practice. Right belief informs right practice. Orthodoxy leads to orthopraxy. Uh, you can't have the latter without the former. Basically, in South Georgia terms, you behave what you believe. 
All right? You know this. If you believe something, it's going to come out in your behavior. That's just the way it is. To even make it more South Georgia, what's in the well comes out in the bucket. What you believe in your heart is going to come out in your life. If I'm carrying around a bottle of Sprite and I spill it, Sprite's going to come out because that's what's in it. That's what happens in your life. Discipleship is practical. When you are truly discipled and you chase after discipleship and you're pouring into uh, yourself and others, and what you learn and what you gain is going to come out in your life. We also, we become what we worship. We become what we worship. Psalm 115.8 says, Those who make idols become like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. The Bible also lets us know in Luke that whoever is fully trained becomes like their teacher. The student becomes just like his teacher. You are who you attract. If you're chasing after something, if you want to be something, if you're looking at these influencers or sports stars or you're looking at somebody in your workplace or you're looking at somebody in the world who has a lot of things that you want and you're kind of chasing after that person and you want to do things like them, you'll become like them. You may not be as successful as them, but you will be like them in their character. So we want to chase after the right things. And so those are the three reasons that we believe we need deep discipleship. Now, we need three foundations for, for us to accomplish this deep discipleship. So that's the that problem has been diagnosed. We have laid out the need for this deep discipleship. So now what do we need to do about it? Well, we need to fix it. And the first thing we need is the Bible. And so this is what this class will be for. This is what this class, the foundations, which you may look at the term and say foundations, and you may be, I don't know what comes to your mind, but I want you to think of it in this, in this sense. Almost every successful business, uh, sports dynasty, every successful company, see the major corporation in the world, they have foundations or fundamentals. And they work on those things, core values that they work on all the time. Maybe they publish them everywhere. They put them ever before you. These are the things that are most important to us. They're most vital to accomplishing our goals. These are things that we will do every day. I, I'm a sports person. So when I think of foundations, I think of fundamentals. The greatest teams in, in sports, they practice fundamentals every single day. The small things. The things that are really, really small. You know, you, you, there's the big famous quote from Vince Lombardi, who is the name of the trophy when you win the Super Bowl. He was a football coach, for those who don't know. He holds up the football and says, this, gentlemen, is a football. Right? Because this is important for their sport. Well, this is the most important thing for us. The first foundation that we have is the Bible. This is what we must use for our life. It is sufficient to answer all things in our life. Everything that we encounter, the scriptures are sufficient for. You say, well, it can't help me in calculus. All right, whatever. You know what I'm talking about. It could teach you how to be disciplined enough to study and learn those principles of calculus. What I mean is all affairs of life, the things that, that, that can cause harm to you in your soul, the things that can bring this depression and anxiety and difficulty in your marriages, difficulty in your workplace relationships, the Scripture is sufficient to answer all of those questions that you have, all of those needs that you have in your life, that we have, that I have in my life. The Scripture is sufficient. We need to know what God said. We need to know the Old Testament and the New Testament. So we're going to have an overview of the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to walk through all the Old Testament books and all the New Testament books, and we're going to make sure that you have a good idea and a good grip of those books and the common theme through them all. We need to know what God spoke 
the content and outlines of how he deli- what he spoke. We're going to give this to you. How he spoke it. What literary, literary genre that it fits in. Is this, is this an apocalyptic book? Is it, is it poetry? What is it? How does it, how does it work? We're going to talk about the authorship. When God spoke. The date of it. Where God spoke. The cultural background. And why God spoke theme and the unity of all the Old Testament books and all the New Testament books, there will be an overview and all these things will be talked about because it's important. If you know why somebody says something and who they're saying it to, where they're saying it from, when they're saying it, when you know these things, it helps you understand what they're trying to say. We need to know know what God meant. That's hermeneutics. We'll study hermeneutics. You're going to learn how to study your Bible. Most of you probably know how to do this, but we're going to try to enhance it. Okay, we're going to try to help you, give you some key points and tools to help you do this. What are the principles of Bible study? What are the principles of interpretation? I hear this all the time. People talk to me about the Bible. They hear me say that I'm a pastor or a minister. I could be riding a bus. I could be sitting on an airplane or whatever. And it, it always comes up because, you know, you start the initial talk, and they may say some really crazy stuff, maybe even bad things. And then they always ask me, what do you do for a living? And I say, I'm a minister or a pastor. And they go, oh, yeah. This is really uncomfortable now. <clears throat> and then we'll talk, and then they'll say, well, that's your interpretation. There is only, we need to understand this, there is only one correct interpretation of the Scriptures. There's only one. There's only one that's correct. I could be wrong in how I interpret the Scripture. And Pablo could be wrong in how he interprets the Scripture. We could be, we could disagree on the same passage. I think it's this. And you may say it's this. And we put all the biblical principles to the test and we try to work through it the best we can because we're trying to find out what the author actually meant with what he said, because when I write something to someone, I have intentions of my meaning. I'm, I'm, I mean something. Too many people are looking for some secret hidden agenda, and secret hidden meanings, and looking for codes and numbers. And Man, just try to figure out what it says plainly before you try to figure out what it says coded. You, you will never get to the codes, right? It, it takes time. It takes work. There is only one right interpretation. Only one of us could be right. If we're disagreeing on a passage, one of us is wrong or both of us is wrong. But both of us can't be right. This goes back to truth. It's either true or it's not. We both can't be right about... There's only one right, correct interpretation. When the author penned the letter, the book in the Bible, he had an intended target. He had an intended audience. There was an intended style. There was an intended meaning. He was writing to someone. All of the Bible is written for you, but not all of it is written to you directly. You can throw stuff at me later. But there are many different applications. You can apply the word in many different ways. Right? We can apply the same passage to our lives differently. Right? You can do that. There's many different applications, but one correct interpretation. just want to make sure we get that correctly. The second reason, the second foundation, sorry, second foundation is theology. So we'll first, we'll study the Bible. We'll study the Old Testament books, the New Testament books. We'll study hermeneutics, how to study the Bible. We'll do all those things. Secondly, we'll study theology because we want to know who God is. We'll study systematic theology. (laughs) We'll study systematic theology. We'll study God the Father. That's called theology proper. We'll study God the Son. That's Christology. We'll study God the Holy Spirit. That's called pneumatology. We'll study God as Savior. This is soteriology. We'll study God as Revealer. This is Bibliology. We'll study Him as Creator. Anthropology. Hamartiology. Hamartiology. That's sin. Okay? Uh, It's just harder to say. 
than angelology and anthropology. And then last is we'll study him as ruler as eschatology. That's like the last things, the end of things. We need to know who God isn't. We study theology so we know who God is. We also study to know who He's not. We want to make sure that we know who He is not as much as we know who He is because there's, there's false theologies that exist out there. There are many heresies. Think of the Trinity. How many heresies that exist just over the Trinity? There's a ton. And if you can know what the heresies are, you can know where not to go, right? You can know where the mistakes have been made. Like we'll just talk about one, like modalism. What does that mean? It's when somebody believes that God shows up in three persons. He's just by himself. He shows up as God the Father when he needs to be God the Father. And he shows up as God the Son when he needs to be God the Son. And he shows up as God the Spirit when he needs to be God the Spirit existing as one uh, deity in three different ways, three different modes. Well, that's a heresy. That's not true. That's not how God exists in the Trinity. He's a triune God. There's three persons and one being. It's not one being that just operates in three different modes. Uh, so we'll discuss that. So I left you a little bit of confusion today. That'll be good for you. Because you want to find out. We need to know these heresies. There are a lot of heresies out there. There are a lot of cults. And they twist just a little bit. They taint Jesus just enough. Right? Is Jesus a created being? No. And if you believe He is, you're in a cult. He is God. He is creator God. And we need to make sure that we understand that. We need to see where the cults have gone wrong. And there's usually some, uh, some things that are kind of problematic with each cult that kind of are similar to each one. They always fall when it comes to Christ. They always mess up when it comes to Jesus. How do you deal with Jesus? Well, they fall when it comes to dealing with Jesus. They always make Him man or make Him created or make Him some way weird and really weird by some of these cults. The brother of Satan, all kind of weird things. Not the brother of Satan. Satan and Jesus don't have the same power. They're not equals. We're going to study world religions. And we'll study how they, how they came to be. Like when they started. We'll get, we'll get an idea of when, they be, uh, when these world religions began. How they began. And kind of the, the, the person that started those things. We'll talk about false gospels, how to recognize a false gospel. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes you kind of, if you're not careful, you can fall for a false gospel. We have to be careful and make sure that we're, we're sure on what the gospel really is. So we'll discuss that. So not only we know who God is and not uh, know who God isn't, but we need to know how God acts. This will be biblical theology. We'll study biblical theology. It's a little bit different than systematic theology. This will be biblical theology. It's a little bit different. But they're good things that we need to study. This is the story of the Bible. There's one story that starts in the very beginning and works itself all the way through to the end. You see the gospel presented in Genesis chapter 3. When man messes up, Adam sins, and we call this federal headship where Adam's sin passes to all mankind. You, you see where Satan, in the be very beginning, he questions the Lord's Word, right? The Bible, we talked about that being a foundation. He, he says, did God really say? He's been doing that since the beginning. And he questions Adam, and he says, you're going to be like God. And well, they wanted to be like God, so they ate of the tree, of the, the one tree they weren't supposed to eat from, because they thought they could be like God. They could be God themselves. And it wasn't just like a mistake. We always look at things like, oh, man, you know, if Adam hadn't made that mistake, if, if some of you guys blame Eve, she hadn't talked him into it, or whatever. He was right there. He could have stopped her if he wanted to. But the, the thing is, we look at it as a mistake. This was not a mistake. This was Adam and Eve shaking their fist in the face of God and saying, you're a liar. I don't believe you anymore. You didn't tell us the truth. 
How could you keep this from us? And they took this fruit and they ate of it. It was rebellion. It wasn't just a simple mistake. It was a shaking their fist in the face of God. And then they ran and hid, put coverings over themselves. And the, the covenant that God had made with them was death. If you obey me perfectly, you can live forever. We're created to live forever. But when Adam sinned, death came into the world and death should have hit him. And this is the first moment of grace that you see in the scriptures. What did he do? God killed an innocent animal. Before this, there was no death in the world. All the animals were eating figs and stuff off the trees. They were doing things right. They were innocent. And then man goes and messes it up and sins. And who dies in the place of man? This innocent animal. Hadn't done anything to anybody. Has known no death. And then man sins and now this animal suffers death because of the sin of man. Well, what does that sound like to you? What does that point to? That's right. This points to Christ. This points us to Jesus, the innocent lamb, who not only had to live the perfect life for us, because now he had to, he's the second and better Adam. Right? Romans 5 lets us know. He is the second Adam. Because Adam, the first Adam, messed it up. So now the second and better Adam came and he lived the perfect life. He didn't sin. So he gained righteousness. He earned righteousness. Well, he didn't gain it in himself, but he, he earned it for you and for me. And then he went to the cross and paid as an innocent lamb, an innocent animal, the lamb of God. He wasn't an animal. He went to the cross in that same way that innocent animal did in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 3, and he crushed the head of the serpent who was nipping at the heel. And that's the gospel. He paid the penalty of sin uh, for you and for me. He appeased the wrath of God on the behalf of sinners. He was our propitiation. That's what we'll study. We'll study the story of the Bible. We'll study the theme of the Scriptures. We'll talk about all those things from Genesis to Revelation. It'll be fun. It'll be good conversation. And then thirdly, in this foundation study, we'll study history. So we'll start with the Scriptures, theology, and then we'll study history. So we'll know His providence. We'll see His hand all the way through history, how the church began, how the church worked through time, We'll see it from the very beginning in the very first century. You'll see how the church started, not only just in history books. We'll look at the Scriptures, but we'll also look at history. We'll see how things developed um, through the Roman Catholic Church. We'll see how things developed at the Reformation. We'll see how things developed all the way through up until today. It'll be fun study. It's going to be a good time. But we'll see God's providence. We'll see God's hand as He protects His Word the truth, the scripture, as he keeps it pure through history. We'll see how he moves people in the right places in the right times through difficulty, through death, through tragedy, and then give us, bring us to where we're at. It's important for us to know what blood has been shed so that you and I can stand, I can stand right here, you can sit at these tables and these nice chairs with air conditioning, maybe not nice chairs, but you got, you got the ability to sit in this room to hear me preach the Bible. And there's a lot of history that allows us to do that right now. It'll be fun to study this. It'll be a good time. We'll know his faithfulness. We'll see some Christian biography. We'll see some faithful men that were able to bring us to this point where we're at now. And then we'll see some historical theology. Some of the, the early church fathers, we, we love the early church fathers. We love them. They're great. But they didn't get everything right. Remember, they, a lot of them came out of some wrong thinking. And so we can see the development, 
happened. We can, we'll get to see and witness uh, how the development of Christian theology developed over the years. It'll be a good time and a good study, and I'm actually looking forward to it. Now, you got the B team tonight. Kyler is at Harris Campus. Um, Kyler will be away next week on vacation. We will start the book that we're going to go through. The book that we're going to go through is called The Year in the Lord by Sinclair Ferguson. It is a great book. It's not a very long book, um, and we'll, we'll work through that. That'll be kind of, of what we do for the uh, church history. That won't be every time. We're going to do different things. What I just went through is what we'll do, but this will be a good study for church history. It will be fun. It will be neat. There will be some cool things that you learn, and you can, we'll have some interaction a little bit. It'll be a fun time. You can learn some things and uh, be able to use this in your, in your knowledge of the Lord. I think it'll give you a better foundation. I think the reason that we can grow from this, it'll help us to, to stand on the truth. Everybody, every Christian, almost every Christian, will experience maybe some doubt of something in their life along the way. The doubts aren't bad. Unless you don't know where to look and you don't actually seek out the truth. I'm a, I'm a pastor who's not afraid of somebody that doubts because I know the truth. And the truth is sufficient. I don't have to trick you. I don't have to hide stuff from you. I can just let you, as long as you go to the truth, the source, you'll be fine. I'm reminded of John the Baptist, who is, Jesus said, is the greatest among men who've born, right? He's, he is great man. He, he was the... Uh, forerunner to Christ. Well, he gets arrested at the end of his life. Do you remember this? He's in jail. Some of you may remember this story. And he begins to doubt. And he calls his disciples over and he says to his disciples, he says, hey, go over and talk to Jesus and ask him this question. Is he the Messiah or are we waiting for another? This is John the Baptist. Do you remember he leapt in the womb? Before he was even born, before he was even outside, he leapt in the womb when he just got near Jesus in the other womb. John the Baptist, who, I mean, he was homeschooled. He lived in the woods. He had weird clothes, ate weird stuff, had bugs in his teeth. He was kind of weird. I'm sorry for homeschoolers. We did it too. But here's the thing. He was a faithful man who was of the voice crying out in the wilderness. He was the forerunner to Christ. He baptized Jesus and said, I don't even have, I shouldn't even hold your sandal. But in a moment, he had a moment of doubt. Here's what he did. He said, go, he talked to the truth. When we, you start doubting, go to the source of truth. This is the truth. This is your source. And you'll find out all the answers you need. That's all I have for you tonight. This is just a basic introduction of what we're going to do. Uh, it's a Year of the Lord by Sinclair Ferguson. The Year of Our Lord. I think it's the actual name of it. Year of Our Lord. Sinclair Ferguson is the author. author. Um, he is an uh, incredible, gifted man. He'll, it'll be the book that we kind of base this off of. And uh, now Kyler will be leading most of the classes, actually all of the classes after next week. And um, listen, there's not a, a more gifted man in church history than Kyler Smith. He's one of the smartest guys I know, if not the smartest. Um, he's close. There's one guy I think may be smarter. But uh, I'm not going to tell him who that is. And I'm not telling him. <laughs> And they're recording this, so I'm not saying it. <laughs> but he is a, he's a fantastic communicator. You will learn a lot. It will be a fun time. This, I think, will help you. I think it'll, it'll help uh, build some deep roots in your life. This will be a good time where you can ask questions and grow, uh, grow in your faith and, and cause deep discipleship in your life. And then what you can do with this, what you learn, is you can pass this off to other people, which is the goal of discipleship to be maturing yourself 
sitting under somebody, learning, and then also to bring somebody else along, to pour into them. If you're a father, man, pour into your kids. If you're a coworker, pour into your coworkers, pour into your friends. Find somebody that you can bring along. It'll be good for you. Let me pray for you, and you can dismiss. If you've got any questions, you can come up afterwards and ask me. Or you can, I know Pablo probably will shout at me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this evening, and we thank you for your word and for your truth. God, I thank you for a faithful group of people who desire to grow deeper, deeper in their relationship with you, that we chase after you, that discipleship isn't just some aimless thing that we do. We are chasing after you. You're the goal to know you more, to know you deeper, to behave more like Jesus, to become closer and more godly every day. This is our goal. This is our desire. I pray that you would empower and enrich the lives of the people in this room, that you give them grace, that you allow them to understand things that they have never understood before, that their level of um, leadership would increase as they bring others along with them, and the level of discipleship would grow very deep in their life. And they would be sure-footed. And if they have a doubt, they would search the truth of the Scriptures to find the answer. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.